This is CBS. I'm Liz Bruner. Kathy Fountain has the day off. As you watch our show today, imagine the four walls around you as your prison. The thought of walking out of your front door brings on a wave of panic. You're too afraid to go out and do Christmas shopping. You can't even go to the store for a gallon of milk, and you're too afraid to take your own child to the hospital in an emergency. Well, it's called agoraphobia, and 10% of us suffer from these kinds of panic attacks. And someone who knows all about this is Martha Cadden. Martha, when did you first realize that you had these fears? What brought them on? How did it all start? For me, it started at church. I went to church one Sunday morning, and I thought perhaps it was the heat. It was in June. And I started feeling very sick to my stomach. Uh, my legs were very wobbly. Uh, my chest was very tight. My heart was racing, about like it is now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just felt like I was going to pass out. So I was taught that you never leave church which is nonsense, but uh, that's how it was. And uh, the symptoms persisted, so I, I decided that I did have to leave. Mm -hmm. The next week, it happened again. The Where third were you? Week, at the church again? At the church again. Then the third week, amazingly, it started on a Saturday, thinking that I had to go to church. So we tried a new church. And of course, it was not the new church, because I had the same problem. And from there, it escalated into so many other areas of my life. How old were you when this started? I was 20 and a bride of two months. A bride of two months. Your husband must have been going, what is the matter here? He did. <laughs> How did he deal with this? Well, at first, of course, we were both very concerned. Uh, we just figured it was something, f you know, physical, and of course it was. And then for the next 23 years, uh, he hung in with me. He had some very angry times, but overall he was very supporting and loving. Did I was ever, very fortunate. Did he ever want to leave? I mean, did, when, in those bad times, did he just say, I've had enough of this, I can't deal with this? Believe it or not, no. I said several times, I need to leave and free you. And of course, he wouldn't hear of it. But no, he never once ever suggested that he leave. You were very, very lucky. How long do you, did you suffer from this at all before you were 20 years old? I mean, did any indication of this before then? Oh, sure. Looking back into my childhood, I was a very, very scared child. Uh, to take a bath, someone had to sit outside of the bathroom. Uh, someone had to sleep with me. Uh, I was afraid of my own shadow growing up, sure. But I thought that was just the way I was. So over these 23 years that you suffered from agoraphobia, how did you hide it from your family? I mean, didn't people know that you, you didn't want to do things or go out of your house? I mean, how did you live? Well, I really didn't live. I existed for 23 years. And I kept it from the family as much as I could. I tried to be as normal as I could, whatever that was. I was heavily medicated all those years, too. Did you just not want to go out of the house then? I mean, what were some of the, your, your panic attacks and your fears? The panic attacks were so severe that I felt that I just couldn't leave the house. I felt safer in the house. Unfortunately, after the 23 years, I was having panic attacks in bed. You, you ended up confining yourself oh, to bed absolutely. and you still had the I problem. I would get up in the morning and take a shower and change my nightgown. That was my whole day. What did, I mean, going back to your family though, I mean, surely you'd have maybe reunions or Christmas time you'd get yeah. together. I mean, how did you, how well, did you answer them when you, you'd say you weren't going to be there? I am from Tampa. I was away for 23 years and uh, many of the years we were able to come home and toward the end it became very difficult. And I would just lie and say my husband couldn't get time off or uh, the children didn't want to leave home anymore. I remember several Christmases just sobbing all day long because I couldn't even answer the phone to speak to the family. You're afraid to even talk to them? Absolutely. The and then finally mm. by evening after all the tranquilizers had taken effect, uh, we would get through and talk and I would lie to them and say, oh, we've been partying up and down the street. The neighbors had us when in fact I had been in my bed in my nightgown all day. So it was a very, very sad time for me. And at Christmas, I always reflected back. That was the worst time of the year, that I was unable to shop for my children. I had to order things out of a catalog. Uh, it still makes me teary thinking about it. What uh, about I your miss children? So much. I mean, do, how many kids do you have? I have two children. How did they deal with this? I mean, what happens if they broke an arm or they got sick and you needed to take them somewhere? Most of the time, I, I had a husband who could leave a job and I would quickly call him and he would take them. Or I'd have a neighbor take them. Mm. 
Yeah. Well, someone else who is joining us today, who's taking some of those first steps to cure her agoraphobia is Marion Higgins, and you're sitting over here shaking your head, <laughs> saying, mm hmm almost in an understanding way of what yeah. uh, well, Martha's our talked about. All our stories, I think, are similar, but they're different in some ways, too, because I was alone when it first hit me. I was also in my mid-20s, and I had two children, but I was divorced and alone, so um, I continued to do a lot of things. I had to do my own shopping. I had to, I'm very nervous right now. <laughs> I had to um, do the emergency things and, and, and all those kinds of things, but I did them at an anxiety so level so high that it was almost unbearable. But I had, I had no choice. I felt these are things I had to do, and so I did them. Do you remember your first panic attack or your first experience with agoraphobia? Well, um, actually, I can remember times as a child having panic feelings, probably as young as six or seven, um, just going to bed and having this overwhelming fear come over me and being a small child not understanding, but for some reason not feeling free to go to my parents or to tell anyone either what I was feeling. So you kept this a secret? Always. Uh, so I think I always had kind of a fearful personality, but I dealt with it and it was not severe until I was about 25 or 26 years old, recently divorced, and I was in a supermarket. And it just hit me so strong. The walls came, came in on me, the, the floor came up, the lights were blazing, and I thought, I'm having a stroke or a heart attack or just something horrible is happening, and I have to get out of here. And I had a basket full of groceries, and my daughter at the time was about eight years old, and I handed her my purse, and I said, pay for the groceries, I have to go outside. And you just ran. And as soon as I got outside, I started to feel better. And I did manage to go back in. But after that, it came at, you know, while I was driving in different places until um, there was no safe place. And I definitely had lots and lots of panic attacks at home. So um, it was terrible. Well, I understand. And you I had didn't a, know what was wrong with me. Yeah, you had a little bit of a test this morning. You're trying to yeah. <laughs> trying to get cured here. What happened this morning? Well, one of the big things that a uh, problem that I've had before and while I was in in the group with Martha um, was eating out. I had a lot of problem. Uh, I'd go to a restaurant and order the food, and as soon as the food would come, I'd feel trapped. Like now, I have to stay here and I have to eat it. And so my, I'd have a panic attack, and I couldn't eat it, and I'd have you to leave. You couldn't even eat? Couldn't eat it, no. I would take it to go. And um, sometimes I would just make excuses. I don't feel well. I have a stomach ache. But the bottom line was I'm having a panic attack. My throat is closing, and my mouth is dry, and I can't swallow. And what happened this morning? Well, this morning we all met for breakfast before coming here, and I ate a hearty breakfast and enjoyed right. it. Right. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> And when we come back, we're going to talk with a doctor who's going to explain why some of these behaviors happen with agoraphobics. Stay with us. Why don't you wake up at 7 a.m. on the weekend, put the kettle on at 8 a.m., or pour your juice at 9 a.m.? You can turn on news and weather, because Eyewitness News Weekend brings you three times the news with the experience of Ann Dwyer and meteorologist Howard Shapiro. That's why Eyewitness News Weekend is coverage you can count on. We're talking about people who suffer from panic attacks and have fears of leaving their home. And joining us right now is Dr. Gemino. And I'm curious, doctor, how does this start? Is there something that triggers this condition in people? There is. It's usually a combination of factors that uh, come into play. Uh, we do know there is a genetic predisposition. So it could be hereditary oh, then? Yes, yes. Uh, there are environmental factors uh, in terms of development. Anything happens between the ages of 1 and 12, for example, a very sensitive age uh, in which you are very impressionable. Maybe traumatic events traumatic or stressful events, situations. Uh, moving to a different town, leaving your school, uh, parents divorcing. Any of those things can cause agoraphobia to develop in somebody? It will be a contributing factor, especially in a person who already has a genetic predisposition towards panic attacks. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, do more women suffer from this condition or, or men or is it equal? Well, there are about 50 books in the market about uh, panic anxiety attacks and uh, most people will tell you that it's more frequent in women than in men. However, I'd like to take issue with that. 
what does happen is that the men are less likely to seek help and they are more likely to self-medicate with alcohol. I think it's about 50-50. So they're better at covering it up. Yes. Men are than, yes. than actually dealing with the situation. Exactly. I think there are probably two schools of thought that you just, you just uh, hinted on. The possibility of being a chemical imbalance as well as a learned behavior. What are your thoughts on that? It's a combination thing, actually. Uh, in order to understand this uh, a little bit better, I think we have to go back to the way uh, the brain is wired. We do have in the pons, which is a part of the brain stem, a group of cells, about 20,000 cells. And it is a seat of the fight or flight reaction. Now, if, for example, a rhinoceros were to come in here and charge, we, will, we would all freak out, including myself, just, you know, <laughs> aim for the exit. And this is a normal reaction. In mm. panic attacks, the same thing happens, except there is no rhinoceros. Okay, we've got a that? call to take from somebody. Nancy in uh, Pinellas Park. What is your question, Nancy? Hi. I've had this since 81, and I still have it. Um, what happens to you, Nancy? It. What happens to you? Um, like, I can't go over the Howard Franklin Bridge. Um, are you just afraid of driving, or are you just afraid of driving over the Howard Franklin? Um, both. I can't go anywhere to drive by myself. I have to have somebody drive me. And you've suffered from this for 11 years now? It's since 81. Wow. Hmm. Common condition, I'm sure, from what she's just saying, common as symptoms there. Very common, very common. Bridges, fear of bridges is a very common uh, avoidant behavior. And what she describes is, in essence, the agoraphobia, which is part and parcel of the panic attack. The panic attack the physical and emotional symptoms that you feel has the basis on the, the biology of the brain. Then you develop a conditioned response because of the fear and you start avoiding things. Mm -hmm. This lady avoids the Howard Franklin Bridge. She probably goes, if she has to go, in the other side of the bay, she uses what I call the phobia road, <laughs> which is uh, uh, a long way road, around. You know. Martha, what are some of the physical symptoms that you suffered from during those 23 years of your condition? Okay, uh, usually my hands get very wet. Uh, I feel with my stomach, so I usually get a very tight stomach. My chest gets very tight. Uh, my legs feel very wobbly. My vision gets very distorted. I hyperventilate. Uh, you feel like death is around the corner. You, f you think you're either having a heart attack or having a stroke or, or just you're going to disintegrate any moment. Marion, would you agree with those? Yeah, yeah, I have pretty much the same symptoms. I think um, it, it usually initially starts with a dry mouth and escalates from there, um, pounding heart, uh, blurred vision, um, just this horrible fear of you, impending doom. You said that, that this first came on for you after you, um, after your first marriage. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. What happened, and then you, you remarried, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, what happened in between those times? Did you still have panic attacks and some of these same fears? Okay, well, uh, initially, after checking out all my physical symptoms and finding nothing physically wrong with me, it was suggested that I see a psychiatrist, which I did, and I had um, a few months of Freudian therapy, which was good in some ways. I learned a lot about myself, but I continued to have panic attacks. Um, it was not identified as panic disorder until I read a book by Claire Weeks called Freedom from Nervous Suffering, and I read it and I said, that's me. And did they, did they stay with you in your second marriage? Uh, well, eventually I was asymptomatic for years. They, my, the symptoms went away and I could do everything. And they came back just within the last year or so. And I just recently got married about three years ago. So it's come back since, since I've remarried. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. We need to take a break. But before we do, I'd like to tell you about an upcoming show, some of the Christmas shows that we have coming up next week. And if you'd like to join us in our studio audience for any of these shows, as always, tickets are free, and you just need to call us at 870-9650. And we will be right back. You witnessed a winner.